and welcome to our Good Friday Act of Worship, a time for reflection and prayer, a time to sing, a time to bring our thanksgiving to God. And this is a joint effort from the congregations of Balfron linked with Fintry, Calern and Strathblane, and we do hope you enjoy them. As we prepare to share in this service, let's pause in a moment's prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to share together in the glorious gospel proclamation that Christ has come, Christ has died for us, and in the hope of the Sunday that is to come. In this moment of reflection, speak within us your words of hope and promise. Remind us that we are not isolated and alone, but we are bonded together with every believer here and across the world, united in one chorus of praise and thanksgiving. So join our hearts and spirits, even if we cannot be joined in person, and hold us in your loving embrace, we pray, now and always. Amen. with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Are you the King of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply. 
and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the King of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the King of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the Praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. The story of Good Friday is a continuation of the horror that had started the night before. It is a story of betrayal and abandonment, of interrogations and trials, of torture, mockery, abuse, hatred, baying crowds, corrupt leaders and cowardly politicians. The whole story of Jesus' last days reads like a catalogue of all the terrible things human beings are capable of. And all these crimes are being perpetrated against the Son of God, against the Word of God which became flesh, in Jesus Christ. It's a hard story to hear because it confronts us with what we mortals are capable of. Because this is not something that just happened in the distant past. This is something we do to Christ today. Every time a human being is being abused in this world. Jesus says at one point, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me. This is like a mirror held up before our eyes, showing us the dark side of human nature. This is the moment when we realise that all the suffering we humans bring on each other, we bring on Christ. The two belong together. But this is also when we fully understand 
that all our human suffering is borne by Jesus Christ. Nothing is alien to him. At every unfair trial, it is Jesus who stands in the dock. Every person who is tortured in prisons all over the world, it is Christ who is abused. Every time someone is persecuted because of what they believe, whether they be Christians in Pakistan and Iran, or Muslims in China and Myanmar, it is Christ who is being persecuted. The children who are abducted in Nigeria, the babies who are starving in Yemen and Malawi, migrants who are dying at the border to the United States, the refugees drowning in the Mediterranean and those whom we lock up in our own country. Always it is Christ who suffers. Every woman and girl in Tigray and so many other places who is raped and abused during times of conflict bears the face of Christ. With every woman who does not feel safe in the streets of their towns or even in their own homes because of the threat of violence, Jesus Christ is right there. Every black person who suffers the daily soul-destroying impact of racism on their lives bears the image of Christ. Every time someone living with dementia is deprived of the contact with loved ones that they long for, every time an elderly person is neglected or maltreated, Every time someone with special needs is demeaned and dismissed, every time a child is neglected or abused, everything that we have lost through illness and disease, be it cancer or COVID, none of this is lost before God, none of it forgotten. None of those soul-destroying hard places are actually God forsaken. The God of love is there in Jesus Christ, right beside God's children suffering with us. In Jesus Christ, God went to the darkest place imaginable, the place where people feel as if they are God forsaken. From that day on, there is no human experience that our God has not shared. There is nowhere that God has not been. There is nowhere that God is not. Just like at the beginning of the story of our faith, we are reminded that what we believe, that Jesus Christ, the one whom we believe in, whose name is Emmanuel, God with us, all of us, always, is always there. The reading is taken from Mark 15, starting at verse 25. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests mocked him to one another, with the scribes saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And one ran, and filling a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. 
And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he thus breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome, who, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered to him, and also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Thanks be to God. It is hard to grasp that this is what God was willing to take on. This is what Jesus was willing to suffer to bring about our salvation, to change life for all God's children and to show us the way to resurrection and new life in him. The story goes that it actually went dark during the three hours when Jesus was dying, even though it was only noontime. This is the darkest time, the hour when we let God die on a cross. It was the point when darkness was greatest and yet even in that darkness there was already a glimmer of hope. We hear that the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Initially this could sound like it would be another portent of doom and despair. But actually this is when the good news starts shimmering through because that torn curtain is a great symbol of how the death of Jesus changed everything. In the days of the temple the thinking was that God in his holiness was separate from humankind, had to be separate from humankind. Sinful human nature and God's holiness could not mix, could not share the same space. That's why there was a holy of holies in the temple, an inner sanctuary where only the high priest would enter once a year on the Day of Atonement to bring a sacrifice. And this separate space where God lived was divided from the rest of the temple with a curtain. So if this curtain this separation between God and humanity was torn at the very point when Jesus died, then this is meant to be a message from God. A message that says loudly and clearly, no more separation. No more stories of a distant God who will punish all who dare to approach in their state of imperfection and sinfulness. No more hopeless abyss between the holiness of God and the fallen nature of humankind. That abyss has been bridged once and for all, has disappeared because of what God in Jesus did, because of the sacrifice he brought. From now on, God is saying, know that I am near, know that I am with you, know that the darkness will not overcome, my light is stronger, know that I love you. The God of love has finally shown his true colours. Through the life and death of Jesus, God reminds his children that at the bottom of all this, Actually, from the very beginning, there is God's love for all people. We may have lost our way. We may have chosen to be separate and followed a path that would take us away from the source of our lives. But God has never given up on us. Over the generations, God has made countless attempts to reach humans send poets and prophets and let us feel the consequences of our life without God. And somehow people have still chosen to go their own way, making excuses why they could not live a godly life. 
So the God of love now chooses to take this extreme measure to get through to us, to help us to understand that life could be different, can be healed, that the rift can be overcome. God becomes one of us in Jesus Christ, becomes fully human and shows us the way of the cross, which is where salvation lies and resurrection, new life, eternal life. Christ is our Redeemer and he becomes the pattern for our lives. Who can even imagine a love so great that it would be ready to sacrifice everything? I'm reminded of that old hymn. My song is love unknown. My sought saviour is love to me. Love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die. Let's hope that we can learn to trust in that love, that unconditional love, and to live it, breathe it, and be changed by it. Amen. Shall we pray? Generous God, it seems impossible that anyone would give what you gave to save men and women, like each one of us. But you gave yourself freely for our sakes. It seems unimaginable that anyone could love the way you did, including outcasts, rebels, and even persecutors, and refusing to ever strike back. But you loved so much that you laid down your life for our sakes. It seems inconceivable that anyone would offer the forgiveness that you did, even as nails pierced your flesh and the cross was stained with your blood. But you did not hold our sins against us and took on yourself the suffering that should have been ours. Forgive us that we have allowed greed and violence, pride and deceit, bitterness and coldness to have a place in our hearts and in our lives. Fill us again with your immeasurable grace, your Holy Spirit, your inexhaustible love, and your unconquerable life, that we may be changed and may express our love and devotion through our lives and our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So as we conclude our Good Friday service, don't rush into the tasks and events of the coming days. Allow yourself time to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus. Mourn his death. There is a sadness to this day that is holy and is part of the Easter story. So stay at the cross like the women who loved Jesus did. Contemplate the, the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Simon Peter. Reflect on how much you are loved and cherished by God that he would go to such lengths to save and redeem you. Because by his stripes we are healed, by his wounds we are made whole. So go in the name of Jesus Christ and live in the salvation made possible by the goodness of this Friday. And may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.